are teaching is called Climate Crisis, Impact on and Solutions from Indigenous Peoples. And um, we're gonna start with a land acknowledgement from Alexi. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alexi Sedona. I'm a member of the Amin Muslim Tribal Band. And, uh, you know, it's always really important to start by acknowledging the land that you're on. And for this format, you know, it, we have to acknowledge the respective lands that we're all on. For me, I'm on the unceded uh, occupied lands of the Chichenyo Ohlone in the territory of Wuchin in Oakland. Um, and I uphold and honor their sovereignty today, even in their continuing uh, efforts to gain federal recognition and assert their sovereignty. And I hold myself accountable to ensuring that I support their voices and uh, make sure that they are leaders in decision-making on their traditional territories. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexi. Um, yeah, I think that's super important to remember. And um, on the note of the land, our first slide is about um, traditional relationships with the land and about the need to um, maintain equilibrium. Um, yeah, you just pass it, yes. Um, so a disclaimer uh, from Priyanka. Um, do you wanna say the disclaimer or should I? Okay, well, I can say it. So um, we, we wanted to do this teach-in to raise awareness because um, our disclaimer is just that we are not um, indigenous to North America. We're just trying to educate ourselves and this is the bare minimum history of what some of some indigenous people have faced in um, what is now the United States. And it's not, we can't super generalize, but um, we just wanted to get a teach in that like um, where Amamutsun tribal youth could share their experiences. So um, Alexi, to start off, can you talk a little bit about the Amamutsun creation story? Thank you so much, Helen. And it's really great that you're really, you put so much effort into organizing this, you and Priyanka, and we really appreciate being here. Um, and yeah, so creation story and just to give a background is um, the Amamutsun are the peoples of the central coast of California who are the descendants of, um, of peoples in like the San Jose and Gilroy region. And so our creation story takes place in Mount Ominum, which is near San Jose. Um, and on Mount Ominum, we were made from clay and we were formed from the clay up there when the waters came down um, after a big flood. And the creator uh, specifically gave us the obligation to take care of Mother Earth and all living things. Um, and so when we were made from this, we are also recognized that we were made from the same materials as our non-human kin. And so we recognize the fog, um, the wind, the rocks as other sentient beings that are our relatives. Um, and so with that humility of being made from the clay of Mount Amunum, um, and with the responsibility that we, we have from Creator, uh, that really determines our worldview and kind of helps tribal memberships steer towards how to, how to be a good person and how to live in a good way. Thank you so much. Um... And I have a question for Stephen next. Um, how did your ancestors learn sustainable ways to take care of Mother Earth? And um, can you elaborate on like their traditional relationships with the land? Hi, yes, thank you. Well, <clears throat> personally, I don't entirely know how we learn these traditional practices, but what I do know is that we had many different ways of tending the land. And one, for example, was learning. we utilized fire as a tool and something that, that helped rejuvenate the land. And so I was reading it through one of the stories and sometimes during the end of a fall season when the grass gets really dry and it's really high up, then the whole field will be burned. And the, the, the burn wouldn't be a very high intensity burn and be very low intensity. And when we look at that and we see where we're at now, we see a lot of very high intensity burns happening. And that is due to a lack of this stewardship and traditional practices of the land causing disastrous 
burns where people are being harmed and injured. So I'm using that one as an example just so we can see how it used to be compared to how it is now. And some, I think burning was really the biggest aspect of our land stewardship. Is there anything else, Alexi, you'd like to add? Well, you know, when you, when you think about it, uh, we believe that we've been here since time immemorial. And now archaeologists can't prove that, and so sometimes people don't really take that as um, valid. But archaeologists have proved that indigenous peoples have been in California for at least 13,000 years. And when you think about that knowledge that can be passed down from generation to generation and learning from your mistakes over 13,000 years, um, that rich knowledge, I think, is really important for learning how to take care of Mother Earth. And, you know, if you try to burn too much, you probably might not have food or resources in that area. And if you burn too little, then you're going to get too much encroachment um, for the important grass seeds that our people had. And now fire was really used along the coast of California too, like Stephen said. And so for our peoples and other peoples up and down the coasts of California, uh, and also in the inland areas as well, fire was used almost like every five years, every couple of years to, to steward that landscape. Thank you, that was super um, illuminating and it's changed so, so much. Um, so, um, Julissa, can you talk a little bit about how, you know, the centuries of colonialism has affected these practices? Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so I think colonialism has affected these practices tremendously. Um, first, at the start, you know, our people from our lands, like, it made this, these practices impossible. And if you think about when colonization happened here in, on the coast of California, what is it like? late 1700s to now we're barely getting back to our lands like this year 2020 so or even in the 2000s so um that's already that's all almost over it's like about 300 years so um completely removing indigenous people from these lands has um had terrible impacts on the environment just like Stephen pointed out that's my like one of the i think most important things to think about is the California wildfires that we're seeing today. And that is a direct result of in removing indigenous people from their lands. And I will say the same for Australia as well. That's a direct result of colonization is are these crazy wildfires. And so um, I will also like to add that practice that's really important to us that is an environmental practice that I don't think people consider is um, treating all relations equally and that's water, land, animals, um, people, we were all seen on one level. And with that relationship, we were able to, like our chairman share stories of how bears would walk along us and deer would walk along us. And we weren't scared of each other, we worked together. So I think those relationships um, have definitely been um, completely ruined. Um, when was the last time you seen a bear walking down San Francisco? Never. Like that used to be their land too. So um, I would, yeah, I could talk on and on about that. So we can move on. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, now that we've kind of brushed just the surface level of the like thousands of years of history that indigenous peoples have had in North America, um, we need to, we need to talk about the history of colonialism and genocide as well, which has been much shorter, but which has destroyed so much of the land. Um, and this topic is a little bit uncomfortable and we don't really hear about it a lot in the textbooks that we see or the education we have. Um, but it is one that's incredibly important to talk about. So um, probably the one of the principles of settler colonialism um, is something called the doctrine of discovery. Um, it basically is um, a popable bull paper papal bull <laughs> released by um, the Pope that basically says that Christian explorers have the right to lay, lay claim to whatever land they discover just because indigenous people weren't considered to have souls by the church at that point in time. So basically this is kind of, it, 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 at this point this thinking was completely incompatible with kind of like the principles of kindness um, that Catholicism had been founded on, but 
basically, you know, you, they needed a way to justify kind of this genocide. And so that's how religion was kind of used to justify it. So um, for Alexi and Julissa, um, Chairman Lopez talks a lot about um, these papal bulls as well as the three periods of colonization. Could you expand kind of a little bit more on how the doctrine of discovery led to that and the effects on indigenous populations? Sure, yes, thank you, I can start. Well, what I think is really important to understand is how Europeans viewed indigenous peoples. And it's a profoundly different, or at least I hope, profoundly different perspective that we have than we have today. Uh, Europeans believed that indigenous peoples had no soul, um, that they needed God, that they needed to have these conquests, that they were inferior. And so these ideas of these people who weren't even human um, were really embedded in the processes of colonialism. Um, and I mean, what happened was just the utter disrespect and um, lack of accounting for the importance of indigenous knowledge systems and other ways of being in the world than not having to believe in Christianity or other types of religion like that, right? So I think that's really important to get across is that these papal bulls kind of allowed the colonization and the brutality to occur. If there wasn't a doctrine of discovery and all of these uh, Catholic Christian colonizers came, they would have to act in a way that would represent that these other human beings are deserving, right? Because in Catholicism, that's kind of a, uh, a teaching. But with these papal bulls and the doctrine of discovery, it was a way to oppress other people who they didn't even see as other people. Julissa, I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, I mean, you you hit a lot of good points. So I, I would just like to add that um, this didn't have just an impact here, but it was also connected to the Atlantic slave trade. So, I mean, the Papal Bulls is a really, really crazy document that allowed a lot of um, traumatic events to occur over history. So um, it led to genocide, it led to slavery. Um, and what you all should know too is that it's being used in American courts today. So the papal bulls has been used and cited to um, still justify the displacement of indigenous peoples today. So it's not something that, oh, I know a, a narrative that's carried a lot about native peoples like, oh, we'll get over it, everything happened in the past. Like, why are you guys still holding on to this stuff that happened years ago with Columbus or some, some you know, those types of statements. Um, but what I like to tell them is, no, we're still seeing the effects today. So, um, you know, just be aware of that and um, learn more. I think that's all of our responsibility. So I'm happy this is happening today. Thank you. That was really necessary to hear because our, our next section is kind of about how that's translated, that type of mentality is translated to um, the treatment of Indigenous people today. Um, so kind of modern displacement. Um, the first section is just about um, physical displacement, how um, the land that indigenous people have resided on for thousands of years has just been completely ravaged. So we, we see this a lot as a result of extractive industries, which is basically um, an industry that extracts a raw material from the earth. We, you know, we see this with the Dakota Access Pipeline protests, that massive oil spill on sacred lands. And actually, right now, even in quarantine, we've been building the border wall on Tahano O'odham, my pronunciation might be wrong, um, sacred land. Literally, construction crews sanctioned by the federal government have dug up and moved the bones of tribal ancestors to keep building that border wall um, across, um, across like a couple states and I think New Mexico and Arizona, and um, we've been seeing, and it has violated um, a lot of laws, at least half a dozen, the Native American Graves Protection Act and the Repatriation Act, and the federal government has simply waived those laws and kept going. Um, and we can cover, and we'll get, we're gonna cover that more um, um, about legal displacement, but now Helen's gonna talk about kind of like a modern, not like a modern, a local um, example of this physical displacement. 
Yeah, so um, a lot of um, a local example is um, the land called Uristak, and um, it lies at the heart of the ancestral lands of the Anamutsan tribal band. Um, and we haven't done introductions, but Steve and Alexi and um, Jalisa are Anamutsan tribal youth, and that's why um, this issue is so pertinent to us today. So um, for thousands of years, Mutsun ancestors um, lived and held sacred ceremonies here, but um, an investor group that purchased the land in an auction is currently seeking to develop um, an open pit sand and gravel mining operation on the property. So um, this just goes to show that they will do anything. They'll mine gravel, they'll seek to extract profit over you know, preserving cultural sites and ceremonial sites that are so sacred. Um, indig indigenous peoples again and again, you know, suffer so much under these systems of colonialism, capitalism, and they've experienced centuries of this, and now it's still happening modern day, in our modern day, in our very own county, um, if you're based in Santa Clara County, um, once again, extraction takes priority over their sacred culture. So, um, Julissa, I just want to give the mic to you. Um, how would the proposed Sergeant Corey represent a continuation of this pattern of economic development rooted in a colonial system? Sorry, <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, you said it right. It's been happening for year, hundreds of years now. Um, and I, I just want to tie it back to what we were speaking speaking on earlier, the physical displacement. It's been um, about 300 years since we've been able to come back to this land. And um, while there are some members living on the land, um, it's very, very few. And that is because of the economic development. So as y'all know, Santa Clara County is a very expensive place to live in. And um, it's very sad and disheartening knowing that a lot of our tribal members have to travel from far places to reach their homelands. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the Santa, uh, Santa Cruz Safeway was built on, you know, they found during construction, they found um, bones from um, members of our tribe. And so I just, it's, it continues to happen. And that's why it's so important to have these conversations. But I do want to open it up to Alexi and Stephen to comment if they have anything to add. Um, yeah, I'll add something. Um, I think it's, uh, well, first I want to say, Jaleesa, I really appreciate what you said. I think you have a good point. And then also, Helen, thank you for acknowledging this. And I think a really big point I really want to make is to, to help us all kind of understand the weight of the amount of time that this land hasn't been with us and the amount of time it has been with us. I think it's really important to acknowledge that. And it's, it's easy to say numbers. It's easy to say, oh, it's been 300 years and we had it for thousands of years. But think about that and really let that sink in. You know, we, we were, were using this land and utilizing this land for thousands of years. And within hundreds of years, 300 to the max, it has lost our occupation and has been owned by someone. So that whole concept of property is in place there where we didn't acknowledge that. We didn't acknowledge that as that's our property and we own that. So to think in 300 years, they now claim this land and they own this land. So, so I think it's really interesting to think that who rightfully deserves to be there and I think it's really important to think about that and, and acknowledge that. Um, that's all I really wanted to say. Alexi, do you have anything else? I'll just add a little bit of context. So we are a federally non-recognized tribe um, and the government uh, failed to ratify a treaty that we signed in the 1850s and instead enacted a state-sponsored genocide. And so we are a landless tribe. You don't have the special rights or privileges of other Native American tribes who have the rights as sovereign nations. So we believe that we are deserving of sovereignty um, and that we are deserving of rights to our lands. However, the federal government does not uphold that. And so we have to face an uphill battle um, being uh, having 
poorer socioeconomic statuses and displacement and other um, effects of coloniality today. That's all. Thank you. And we actually do have a question from Ronick. Um, what is the impact of modern policing on indigenous land um, in continuing a process of colonization? And what are some things that need to be changed or abolished in that process? If anyone wants to jump in. Well, I would like to say that, yeah, for us, like what does indigenous land mean, right? Like that can mean all of Turtle Island. Um, and here in the United States, that could also mean um, reservation lands. For us, we don't have reservations and there aren't really like really big reservations in California because of that um, state sponsored genocide that was specific to California history. Just a shout out to a textbook, um, An American Genocide by Benjamin Madley does speak about the California state sponsored genocide. And so policing on indigenous land um, for other communities means issues around sovereignty, issues around the government actually upholding these treaties that uh, give tribal nations the authority over their own homelands um, and that government to government relationship. And um, for us, indigenous land is all of our ancestral territory or our indigenous land. And so we don't have it. Uh, everything's almost an issue because yeah, there is policing that is affected in the same way. Um, and it's just a bit of a different context for us. Yeah, and I just wanted to add to that. Um, I, a lot of my stories come from what my elders tell me and Val, you know, and his sisters would say that, you know, when they were younger, they lived off the land. They'd go pick mushrooms and, you know, get fruit, um, shear sheep, like they, but over time their policing got, like policing has always happened over indigenous lands, but it, he even saw in his lifetime it get worse. So it became illegal to, you know, go on certain like private property or gather. Um, and even today I hear stories of my uncles being, you know, they'll be gathering on the side of the highway and a police will come and be like, what are you doing? Like physic, like a police officer, you know? So like they're literally putting their lives on the line sometimes just to access their indigenous lands. Like how twisted is that? And um, I just, yeah, so it is happening, it's ongoing, and just like Alexi said, the answer is give us authority, give us, and like we've never owned the land, that is not how we conceive culturally what we're, our relationship is to the land, we have a responsibility to the land, and creator put us as, you know, our, our tribe um, in that place to do it, so let us, you know, continue, um, like, taking on that responsibility and doing what's necessary, you know? Um, so yeah, that's the answer. Just give our land back <laughs> as if it was that easy. <laughs> For sure. And actually that's um, a really good tie into um, the next um, type of modern displacement, which is legal displacement. Julissa's already um, covered really well, kind of how the doctrine of discovery has been used to um, displace indigenous people, but um, we, there's also the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples or um, UNDRIP. So it is technically common international law, but the United States doesn't follow it. So basically the way the United States works now is they say they'll consult native people, but there's no actual legal veto power in terms of the land they reside on or sacred land. So, um, uh, la and that's why uh, last May, um, Homeland Security waived nearly three dozen environmental and cultural laws um, without any repercussions, um, allowing them to um, further construct on Oregon Pipe Cactus National Monument and um, a lot of other indigenous sacred land. Um, so Alexi, can you kind of further explain the significance of um, UNDRIP? Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Priyanka. Well, I think it's really important to acknowledge, yeah, UNDRIP has been um, in the works for a few decades. It was, uh, it came out in 2007, but from the 90s and maybe before that, there was kind of a push to get these indigenous rights. And um, I also want to speak to the, the idea of indigenous, you know, that wasn't really a, a collective idea for a while. Um, and I think like the American Indian movement and other movements like that kind of 
uh, establish that solidarity where these lines of the nations between the U.S. and Canada and Mexico and stuff are just, they're not really upheld in indigenous ontologies. Um, and so this idea of being an indigenous person came about and it kind of helped with our solidarity amongst other indigenous peoples. And yeah, this declaration has been really great. And I think um, a lot of countries were on board with it. And I think the United States and Canada were two countries that were a bit hesitant to adopt it. And they, they did after 2007, a couple of years after, I believe. And, you know, one thing where I really experienced UNDRIP and learned about it was at uh, this United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, uh, which is a forum at the United Nations that I attended a couple of years back. And I heard a lot of people um, who were the authors or helped kind of create this um, speak about it. And one thing that they mentioned was that they think that there needs to be a globally binding instrument to hold extractive industries accountable. So there aren't any of these like binding instruments that Priyanka was kind of mentioning. And so there's not really a lot of teeth to this, but I do think that it kind of represents this great idea and what, uh, what could be. Um, and I think we're seeing it on maybe case by case individual basis of other indigenous peoples gaining rights through UNDRIP. Um, and I think as more indigenous communities exercise the rights given in UNDRIP, uh, there is more possibilities for this to actually be implemented here in California or um, in other places where settler colonial nations are hostile to the indigenous peoples. And Stephen, would you be able to um, expand on the necessity of indigenous peoples um, into these issues? Yeah, um, Alexia, I really appreciate what you said. I feel like you have a really good perspective on this. And I guess why it's so necessary to have indigenous input in these is because there's there's a, a huge dividing line that occurs and that shouldn't occur, but it has where indigenous people tend to acknowledge their relationship with the earth and the land and the water and all living beings, you know, and to have that acknowledgement and to have that understanding and awareness is crucial into working with any any concept of, of sharing this planet and working through any sort of, of laws regarding native people or even just, just living. And to have indigenous input, I feel gives a very deep perspective on what's, what's right internally and externally. And, and it helps us to really find a grounding in it. But it, I mean, even just that, that <clears throat> question alone, it's, it's kind of difficult because for those who do seek indigenous input and perspective, it, it needs to be coming from a genuine place. It needs to be coming from someone who's willing to change rather than to take, which is continuing that, that concept of colonization. Uh, Alexi, what, would you like to add something? Sure, thanks, Stephen. Um, well, I think one thing that came to mind too is we may not have talked a lot about uh, or defined settler colonialism, and that's kind of the, the processes of colonialism where folks come in and they're here to stay. So there is colonialism generally, and that usually uh, surfaces in you know people trying to extract these extractive industries, uh, but perhaps not people trying to settle that land. And here in the United States uh, and Australia and um, Canada, there's other, many other countries that are settler colonial nations. And these settler colonial nations uh, continue to dispossess indigenous peoples and invalidate their claims to land uh, to exist, right? The foundation of the United States um, is conditional that people rec recognize that the United States has a certain right to this land. Um, and as indigenous peoples, we're trying to invalidate that claim. Uh, next, I'd like to kind of riff a little bit about, you know, um, the different perspectives that between Western ways of knowing and indigenous ways of knowing. So these are really two really separate systems. And so 
trying to incorporate these together uh, can be really problematic, can be a form of extraction of indigenous knowledge too, right? Extraction doesn't have to just be physical extraction, can be knowledge extraction or other forms of extraction. And sometimes when you look at these different perspectives and you try to equivocate them and put them together uh, to get each other to understand, you lose out on a lot of the different ways of understanding the world. Um, so for us, we believe that fog is a sentient being that is our relative, right? Trying to communicate that to a Western framework is just very difficult. Um, and then to move it back today into the California context, our rights of our land are kind of limited to consultation. And consultation really just means, hey, we're gonna extract over here, we're gonna dig up um, some burial or something like that. What should we do with it? What do you think? You have 30 days to comment. Uh, once we receive your comment, we're done, we're cleared, we've done our duty, and we're just gonna keep doing whatever we wanna do because your comment really doesn't actually matter. It's just, uh, a way of looking like California cares about the indigenous people's um, authority over their lands. And you can even say that about ideas about truth and reconciliation, right? These official apologies that uh, Gavin Newsom and uh, Justin Trudeau kind of admit, you know, like what are these apologies actually doing? I think these are a bit performative. Um, and I think we really need to look at how the indigenous voices um, in government structures are actually being are actually being understood and whether or not they're actually being listened to and making any change. Yeah, and what you said about kind of like the Western framework that kind of renders a lot of indigenous knowledge, just something that most people who, most settlers on this land just don't understand is kind of something that we were gonna talk about too and um, with conceptual displacement. And um, that's something that um, Helen and I were high school students. So that's something that we see every day in the classroom. And on that slide, actually, there's um, a history textbook that says when the European settlers arrived, they needed land to live on. The First Nations peoples agreed to move to different areas to make room for the new settlements. And that's kind of just really indicative of um, what we see in the classroom, the type of history that we're taught about indigenous peoples. And it's just kind of like a continuous reaffirmation of that anti-Indigenous violence that's just kind of being, we called it a fairy tale, turned into a fairy tale for the children. You see these like these preschoolers in that picture having that first Thanksgiving like play, recreating that in kind of a romanticized way. And it just kind of turns education as well as the government as what you were saying, that kind of performative apology into a, like the perfect vehicle for replicating these settler structures over and over again. So um, I guess the way we're looking, like the way, some ways that um, we've been trying to, what we've been trying to do is, um, you know, look to decolonize our minds, at least start to do it. Um, so, you know, seeking out indigenous authored accounts and research, as well as looking up the, the tribal land that you reside on. Um, a good uh, resource for that is native-land.ca and Helen will put that in the chat. Um, so through that, it kind of like will show you the um, people who, peoples who've resided on that land that you live on um, and the kind of the history of those peoples. Um, and Julissa, you do a lot of research on this kind of um, issue. So why is it so important for indigenous peoples to be able to tell their own history? Sorry, I keep forgetting I'm muted. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm glad you all brought this up because uh, this ties back to, I mean, even specifically in California, the economic development and how that attaches to colonialism. So in California, um, you know, we learn about the missions, we build the missions in fourth grade, a lot of us, and we recreate them and we're told these romanticized stories about how colonization happened, which we know isn't true. Um, and what I, I saw this post once and it was like, would you ask students to build plantations? No. So why are you asking them to build missions, right? And this all has to do with California's efforts to romanticize that history and 
make money off of it. So the missions are a big tourist industry. The like, what is it? The El Camino Real highways, like those bells you see, those haunt me, but they they symbolize something different to a Western eye than they do to my indigenous perspective. So um, I'm glad you brought that up too, Alexi, about living in those two different worlds. Um, and I will say my research is based in psychology. So I'm getting a PhD in psychology right now. So I look at how these misrepresentations and invisibility of indigenous peoples impacts your psychology and your mind. So how non-natives think about native people and how natives think about themselves. So we do know by research that if when, and this happens most of the time, it happened to me, um, if a child grows up and doesn't have one native peer in their classroom or is not taught by one native teacher, which is most likely the case, um, it makes it harder for them to imagine what their future can be like. So they don't have models of self that represent um, success in, um, you know, in their families, unfortunately, a lot of times because of those colonial and generational impacts. So a lot of times what we grow up believing is that we can only become um, a reflection of the intergenerational trauma that we've seen all of our lives. And um, that's why it's so important, like you said, to highlight those indigenous voices, share indigenous resources, so you can see the truth. And I would like to plug an organization I work with a lot um, is Illuminative. So they have a, and I'll put it in the chat for y'all, they have an Instagram, they have a website, they have a, a ton of educational resources. Um, and they're really this like, um, how do you say, they're a consulting company. So their, their sole purpose and existence is to reshape the narrative and image of indigenous people across the Americas. So um, I feel like it's a great resource for anybody to check out at any age. Um, but yeah, that's kind of like my two cents on this. Yeah, and building off of that for Alexi, Stephen, and Julissa, what was kind of like your experience about learning about indigenous history, yours and just in general in the classroom? Um, I'll go. <laughs> so I grew up in northern Idaho, so I had a little different experience than the California sort of history and teaching because as Julissa said, it was taught about the missions and how the missions were this great place that all the native people came and and it was all they were coming there to learn about christianity and learn about agriculture you know it, i feel like that's the misconception that comes from california and um and what you're taught in school what i was taught in idaho we only went over the native history one time and that was in fourth grade and we were talking about the Lewis and Clark expedition. And that was the only time we talked about it. Otherwise, completely out of the way. So it was very neglected. And as, as you're saying, it's, it's a fairy tale. It's very romanticized. It's this jolly, happy time. And then it's acknowledged that the native people all kind of died, but it's also brushed over quickly that it's just like, oh yeah, whatever happened. And yet there's no taking time to realize the weight of the situation and to kind of talk about how how it's shifting right now and how some people aren't accepting it and i have a quote from this book what does justice look like by Waziatuin, and it said she says some people are so deeply invested in the myths and icons they have created they will continue to defend them at all costs those whose jobs or reputations depend on their preservation for example. And then another thing is when Native people are shown that history, as Julissa was saying in psychology, is, is how you take that in. Well, another quote from Waziatuin is, if we think deeply about the pain of our ancestors, we become more aware of our own pain and how our pain is connected to that of our ancestors. And it's, it's almost like a self relearning, but to bring it into modern time is I'm going to college at Cabrillo College and I have the honor to take Native American courses there with a gentleman named Stan Rushworth, who has presented me and many other people at the school with different books to read from Native perspectives. And, and it's totally shifting the way that I am learning about Native experience through 
education and through school. So I can add a whole bunch of books if you're interested on the chat, but that, that's pretty much my experience so far. Thank you so much for um, talking about the knowledge you're learning from the books and your classes. And um, that's super cool that you have these like, um, that these classes have reshaped your like learning a lot. And we're learning a ton from you today. So um, I guess you're passing it on. Um, to um, Alexi and Julissa, did you have anything to talk about um, regarding your experiences learning about the history in the classroom? Or? I guess I can just add that, yeah, you know, I was um, raised in the, the Bay Area uh, in Ohlone territory, not in Amamutsun territory. Um, we're, as Amamutsun peoples, we're part of the larger Ohlone group, which is kind of the, the San Francisco area, the East Bay, um, down to San Jose and into the Monterey Bay Area. And so being raised in Ohlone territory, yeah, I did learn about the history of the the indigenous peoples and I took a trip to Mission Dolores in San Francisco and I think what really struck me is there was kind of like a, a model of a mission and all of the, the indigenous people looked really happy to be there and I remember thinking in it in like a romantic way like wow that probably looked so nice it's probably so nice to be there and just you know as a fourth grader not really knowing any better um, and just seeing this little model it looked so cool um, and exciting uh, and I think, yeah, years later, I mean, we, we learned how silly that was. And I kind of just laugh now because what else can you do besides laugh? A couple of years back, I went to another mission and I was asking one of the docents and the docents are the people in charge of telling the history of the mission, you know. And this docent told me that the native Ohlone people were Stone Age people who needed to be brought to the missions. And then right after that, I told her, oh, I'm one of those Stone Age people's ancestors, and I'm here to learn more about it. And then she kind of just stopped talking, got really quiet and defensive. It was kind of entertaining. And, you know, sometimes it's hard to sit with that. And so I try to look back and kind of laugh at it now and really work hard to change that. But it, it is really tough to hear, and it doesn't feel good when you know that. Like, the, the younger generations might have to experience that, too, and I don't want that to happen. Yeah, thank you so much for um, speaking on that experience. I know my face was probably like, when I heard about the docent literally having to defend that position. And I'm glad we're um, educating ourselves in this way and um, hearing your perspective more. And um, it's good to hear that like, we can all learn and grow from learning about um, like indigenous ancestors experiences and what they went through instead of um, yeah, taking the colonizer's point of view for whatever they, um, whatever they romanticize it as. So um, unless Julissa had something else to add, um, do you, did you have anything else to add or I, I'm about to ask you another question anyway? I can add one to ask the next question. Okay, awesome. So the next question is, um, we just wanna cover like, what are some of the most, mis Misconcep most common misconceptions about ind indigenous peoples that you faced and um, yeah. Yeah, um, uh, there are many um, misconceptions. We could list them all. Um, one, I think I'm gonna, you know, shout out Illuminative again, but they actually did a nationwide study where they um, asked, they surveyed people and they collected what are the most common misconceptions. Um, so some of them being, you know, we're the people of the past, we don't exist anymore. Um, we, if we do exist, we only want government reparations. We just want to live off the government and get all the free stuff when we know we don't get free stuff. <laughs> it's like, I wish I got free stuff. Um, yeah, and I um, mean, then there's these like really dangerous um, sexualized romanticized images of like Pocahontas and um, uh, just indigenous women as these like savage sexual beings um, that are just that just exist for the colonizers gaze um, and I think um, you know there's a list I mean the mascots are a huge uh, misrepresentation of native peoples um, and there are people all over the country fighting to uh, against these representations um, and so I would just like to highlight um, that there's real power to these because 
the way you view our people is going to affect how you interact with us and interact with supporting our policies. Um, that's the whole reason, you know, we're in this position now is that these policies keep pushing us down and oppressing us, um, but we can't um, make any change when people don't see who we really are. So I feel like for me, a lot of my um, purpose in life is to reshape these misconceptions of Native people. Um, yeah, thank you so much for talking about those misconceptions. And I know um, a lot of people are always like, why is, I guess, like so-and-so like joke so offensive and why is that mascot so offensive or cultural appropriation or whatever new thing it is um, that is disrespecting indigenous culture. And I think um, your explanation is really good because it is like the way we perceive um, like a culture is like the way um, it's gonna translate to like support of policy, support just respecting them in general. And I think that's why things like cultural appropriation and making jokes are so harmful sometimes because it's that public um, perception. Um, I think we're gonna move on to our next topic, which is the adverse effects of you know, the climate crisis on indigenous peoples. And the first thing I'm gonna talk about is the missing murdered indig indigenous women epidemic. So um, it doesn't really seem super evident why, how it's connected to climate change at first, but it's the same systems of extraction and um, capitalism and these fossil fuel industries at play again because with every m pipeline and mining plan um, they set up these like militarized forces and workers in man camps and then there's these huge um, like statistics where um, like indigenous women near these man camps every time they spring up um, they go missing they get murdered and um, with every new man camp the list gets bigger so um, five over 5,000 have gone missing since 2016 um, 84 percent of Native women experience violent violence and are murdered at a rate 10 times higher than any any other race. Um, so pipelines, fossil fuel industry profits, and these systems of extraction not only destroy cultures and lands, but they destroy um, directly destroy like lives and um, cause cultures to lose, you know, um, their sisters. And we need justice right now. Um, another aspect is the yeah, the literal extraction and industry development on or near indigenous lands and territories by corporations and their interests, um, such as toxic facilities, mines, electrical generation facilities. They have so many, um, all the aftershocks go on to communities of color, such as indigenous peoples, such as um, like health, social, environmental, um, cultural impacts um, at all stages of the energy cycle, which is exactly what's going on with the proposed quarry at Eurostack right now is they want to extract um, gravel and possibly produce oil as well there. And um, another statistic is 75% of all abandoned uranium mines are on native land. And that's super dangerous because um, radiation and they don't want to put it on, you know, where everyone else is, they put it on native land. Um, so yeah, um, Julissa, what are, I guess, maybe you speak on like, what are indigenous peoples doing across the country to address this issue? Because it's really, really important and we wanna get involved. Yeah, so um, I mean, just per, as like a personal side note, I think for a lot of native women, um, experience violence and, you know, sexual violence and physical violence, mental, um, phys, uh, mental violence, um, it doesn't become a question of if it will happen, but when it will happen to you. So I think that's important to realize is the psychological impacts it's had. Um, um, you begin to kind of accept that it's meant to happen to you because it happens to everyone that you know too. And so I think it's really important that we're fighting against these systems. And I like have so much respect for you all to bring this into the conversations because I feel like, like you said, a lot of people put these two together um, and realize that um, we're not only destroying our land, but we're destroying our women too. And um, so thank you so much for bringing that up. And as far as what people are doing across the nation, I mean, there is there are policies in place being fought for to be passed. Um, I was just in Washington, D.C. in January to um, advocate and um, go. I was like going to um, state representatives offices to advocate for the pass of 
the reauthorization of VAWA, which is the Violence Against Women Act. So we see that in this, um, like over history, it's colonizers and non-native people have found ways to work the system in kind of these loopholes to get away with um, very harmful acts. So we've been talking about this today, right? Well, in uh, the 1970s, the VAWA Act actually before that, um, tribes had the authority, sovereign nations, so not nations like, um, unfortunately, the Amamutsun, because we're not a sovereign nation, like Alexi pointed out, we don't have our own lands, um, but tribes that do have their own lands and um, are able to govern those lands, they had the authority to prosecute non-Native perpetrators for the violence they committed, but that, that um, authorization was revoked from them. And so for the past 50 years, tribes have not had that authority. So literally non-native people are able to go on reservation lands, commit crimes, harm women, kill and steal women, leave the lands and not be prosecuted because the tribes don't have the authority over them. And even if they are caught by the federal government, over 70% of cases sent to the federal government that involve violence against native women are dismissed for various reasons. So they did find a loophole, they found a way and they know that they're able to get away with these things. So, and it's a direct, uh, the, the man camps directly contribute to this issue. So, um, you know, we're fighting for that um, VAWA to be reauthorized and to re-grant tribes the authority to um, prosecute non-natives, that's one thing. Um, another thing, I mean, there's amazing organizations like Urban Indian Health Institute that put out, which I'm sure like you might've got these statistics from, like they put out a really great report on um, uh, the rates of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Um, another, um, there's people, there's native lawyers doing this work. Um, so I would say, you know, if you are interested, I mean, a lot of my research is focused around this stuff. So I'm more than happy to talk to any youth outside of this um, if you want to learn more. Yeah, thank you so much for um, speaking on that and giving resources about where to learn more and get involved because, um, yeah, it's really heartbreaking to hear that, like what you said about it being like a matter of when and not if. And the fact that like man camps are, they can get away with it so blatantly, which is what's been happening the pa over the past centuries. I mean, to all indigenous peoples. So um, to get back onto, oh, did you say something? Sorry, we do have, we have one more question that's kind of related to this um, in the Q and A box. Um, how does the government delegate which tribes are and are not recognized? Well, um, you know, uh, the, the tribes that are recognized had treaties and they signed treaties that were ratified by the federal government. And these were nation to nation agreements and treaties are the highest law of the land. Um, for other cases uh, where the places were part of the United States a bit later on, such as California, um, such as Alaska, and why there were different histories. Um, so the indigenous peoples of Hawaii, for example, they're not, they don't have any federal recognition um, or any like special rights that they are due. Um, here in California, there was the failure to ratify the treaties that um, would have given California Indians seven and a half million acres in the Central Valley. So in the 1850s, uh, they decided that instead of ratifying these treaties and giving this much land, and this is, of course, the area of like the gold rush, right? That they would just enact a state-sponsored genocide um, and pay people from uh, treasury bonds to kill California Indians. Um, so this is a very place-based history of California. Um, and the federally recognized tribes here in California uh, don't have those treaties. They're recognized later on. And the process for the federally rec recognized tribes in California was basically based off this guy named Dorrington and the Dorrington Report in the early 20th century, the 1910s, 1920s. And Dorrington was tasked with looking to see if there were any homeless Indians. And so he went around looking for homeless Indians and he did a terrible job. He didn't really visit a lot of native communities at all. He just did word of mouth. Um, and so the tribes that were recognized were deemed homeless by Dorrington. And then the other tribes that were okay and for our context, um, he received word that 
the San Juan band was being treated well by the Catholic Church and they didn't need any land or anything. And so that's why we're not really federally recognized. Um, additionally, we, we did have deserved rights in like the Treaty of Guadalupe and other issues. Um, and we did petition for federal recognition in 1994 and we're still waiting back to hear back. Um, and to reiterate something that our tribal chairman says a lot too is uh, it's important to have healthy relationships with people and the federal government isn't a healthy institution. Um, and so we don't really actually want to have a relationship with the federal government right now. Um, we've been really lucky to have um, done things where we've gotten our land rights back in a certain way, access rights, not ownership rights. Um, and we're, we're really trying to work around the injustices that are just embedded in this whole process. And, you know, settler colonialism uh, acts in very, surfaces in very different ways across different contexts. And so for here in California, it's definitely a distinct history. Um, yeah, and I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you um, so much for talking about that and giving that like distinction um, about like how it's, we don't maybe that healthy, like the federal government itself isn't really a healthy relationship. Um, so to maybe go on to a happier note, um, well, not happier per se, but a more hopeful, um, just centered note, our next slide is about um, indigenous solutions and um, following your leadership to solve the climate crisis. And I guess not only climate, but like address justice. Um, so I just wanted to start off by talking a little bit about decolonization and allyship, allyship before um, asking my questions. So um, what I've learned from like research and talking to you all over the past like week or so is that like um, decolonization means challenging colonial ideas that flow into education, the media, government policies, and the way our minds work. And that's kind of like the conceptual displacement that Priyanka was talking about with our education system and how everything is the colonizer mindset. So to properly bring about decolonization, it's super duper important to uplift, uplift, uplift sorry, I can talk, actual um, indigenous voices. And I think that's why um, we also need to talk about allyship because being a good ally is about, I guess, like disrupting, like making an effort to call others out when they and hold people accountable when they are displaying oppressive behaviors and educate others on the realities and histories of marginalized people. Um, and like, you know, like telling people that like history, the way you've learned history is not necessarily like the right history or, you know, the true history, because history can't really be super objective, but there's a point where it's literally romanticized and there was genocide going on and you don't know about it. Um, so just like the conceptual displacement again, we have to continue to recognize that um, indigenous peoples have ownership, control, um, access and possession of their information and knowledge and stories. So I just want to ask you guys personally, like what is the most important thing for non-indigenous people and activists to understand about your history um, and to be a better ally. Yeah, I think I can start this one off, but um, I'm happy to hear what Alexi and Steven have to say too. Um, so I think, I mean, you guys are doing the work now, learning, you know, what traditional territories you're on learning about the people's lands that you live on, what actions are, you know, taking place right now, because I'm sure there's active tribes wherever you are in America. Um, and also um, unlearning all of that that you learned, unfortunately, growing up from the K through 12 system and um, just reaching out for those indigenous authorships and um, indigenous led spaces and making that space for indigenous people like i really appreciate you all like inviting us to speak instead of thinking you know like oh let's just have our own powerpoint where we talk about what we want like it's it's you know putting the indigenous people's voices ahead of your own i think is a really important thing and one thing i like that um i learned from another activist that i interviewed was you know do the work like um when we need you to be out in the streets protesting, like come out, you know, when we need you to help us make sandwiches for our cousins, like come out, like when we need you to hold signs, come out, like do the work. So 
you know, we can do what we can be on the front lines too, and like help us do that work so we can be in the front. Um, and we appreciate it. Like we're all about relations and, you know, honoring each other. So um, you helping us will only help, you know, yourselves and the world too. So I, I think it's um, super important to get active. And I'm like, so, so proud you all are getting this active in high school. Like I'm really jealous actually. <laughs> Yeah, thank you um, so much for that amazing answer. And um, yeah, we're just all doing our best and we want to learn a ton from you and we hope this teaching is helping everyone learn as well. Um, uh, Priyanka or anyone else, Stephen, Alexi, did you have anything to add on that? Like what we should understand or I guess segue into Priyanka's other question about um, what to do? Well, I think one thing that might be good to recognize is this idea of intergenerational trauma, um, trauma that was inflicted on past generations um, of our ancestors who were oppressed. And that has, that surfaces in many different ways in our community today. Uh, and that sometimes it is emotionally taxing to be in certain spaces that feel hostile. And that can look like a number of different things. So I, I, I'm not having a hard time like pinpointing something really specific. Uh, and so something I think about sometimes is, you know, talking about genocide all the time. Does that relive that trauma? Um, and also, can that story being told help with healing? Right? And so there's two different ways it can go. I think it really depends on that relationship you have with who you're sharing with in that space. Um, so I think creating a good space where it, it doesn't feel draining and triggering, um, but instead feels generative and healing. Um, thank you. That segues really well into um, my next question, which is kind of about like how um, what we can learn to heal and like spirituality rise, um, how we can solve the climate crisis and like learn from like, I guess, you know, prayer and ceremony more. Well, Stephen is a, a native steward. Um, I don't know if Stephen could have space for that, but he has a lot of experience with that, I think. And Stephen, if you could just explain kind of your role as a steward, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, <clears throat> before I can get into healing and, and spirituality i think in ceremony it's it's really important to allow yourself to be open because as i mentioned earlier is when we are so heavily invested in something that isn't true we don't want to accept what is true because then it dismantles our whole our whole existence and an analogy i like to use is picture you build a whole city and this city is nice and all the buildings are really all structurally sound, but underneath that city is sand. When some kind of disaster happens, that whole thing is gonna crumble because the foundation isn't secure. And I don't promote building cities. I'm using it as an analogy. But um, what I really mean by that is the foundation is coming to that core of your truth and to allow yourself to be open and to accept that truth is very crucial as the first step. There's a lot you can do all around that, but in order to really make the progress, you have to look within and accept and be open to learn. And especially from the native people that you live around and occupy the same land, because we all share this land now. And another thing that Stan Rushworth, my teacher says, said all the Europeans aren't going to hop on their canoes and go back to Europe. It's we all live here now and we have to find a way to work together at this point. So to kind of go into solving the cr climate crisis, it's, it's a hundred percent. I agree. It has to be indigenous led, but with that said, it has to be a partnership. It has to be a full on partnership because there's not enough indigenous people in the United States to really fully make that change on our own. You know, we definitely have a lot of very strong people and a lot of very strong minds, 
but through the partnerships we've had with state parks and UC Berkeley, coming together to learn about our past and our future is so crucial. So we've done work with UC Berkeley and archeology span to learn more about our past, to learn what kind of, of plants and what kind of animals we utilized and we interacted with. And to learn that helps us to reshape the whole image of how we see the land today. And for example, we are working on a project in up the coast, north of Santa Cruz and Pescadero area and pretty much on Año Nuevo State Park. And through this project, we were able to get an idea of how this whole area used to look. And before it was this grassland, very much occupied by different grasses and species, but now it's mostly dominated by Douglas fir trees. So it went from being a prairie of grasslands to a forest. And Douglas fir drops loads of needles, and those needles all choke out the ground. And choking out the ground doesn't allow for other species to grow, grow so it becomes dominant. And so learning that has shaped our project of where we're going. And so we're working together as the stewardship because we have our own land stewards. And to kind of address what Alexi said earlier is we don't have any land that is technically for us. We are using shared land with state parks. So when you compare that to another land trust, they have land that they technically own, quote unquote, because we and to really just acknowledge this we don't believe in land own, land ownership that's not part of what we feel and believe we are part of the land we don't own the land you know the land is is equally as relative as people are to us you know it's it's all a very mutual and it's it's a relationship is really what i want to say um uh, Alexi or Jalisa, do you have anything you'd like to add? Well, could I, could I say one thing, one other thing then? One really quick quote from this book. Um, this book is called Mean Spirit by Linda Hogan. And it's based in the 20s during, uh, with the Oso Osage tribe in Oklahoma. And it's, during their time with finding oil on native land and the murders that came after learning about that oil and how settlers came to take that oil to take advantage of the wealth and money from that. And so this is just a quote from the book. I just gave you context, it's not relative to this quote, but this quote really shows our perspective on land stewardship. Honor Father Sky and Mother Earth. Look after everything. Life resides in all things, even the motionless stones. Take care of the insects, for they have their place, and the plants and trees, for they feed the people. Everything on earth, every creature and plant, wants to live without pain, so do them no harm. Treat all people in creation with respect. Live gently with the land. We are one with the land. We are part of everything in our world, part of the roundness and cycles of life. The world does not belong to us. We belong to the world, and all life is sacred. Yeah, thank you so much. I think that's actually a really excellent place to close. Um, we are actually a little bit over time but um on this slide we have um a few more um indigenous-led environmental organizations and um activists and um steve and alexi julissa um do you have anything um you want to say to kind of conclude just thank you for giving us the space i mean um i really appreciate it yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it too. And um, just kind of upholding the uh, indigenous peoples of the lands that you're on is always so important. And so I think, you know, living in 
the Silicon Valley Ohlone region of holding Ohlone voices is always really important. Um, I think we're all just really thankful that we got to have this conversation with you. And I think during this whole process, we all were inspired by the work uh, Priyanka and Helen were doing and um, just being a youth and doing so much and learning so much already is just a great step ahead. And so we're, we're confident that you'll be great allies for us and uphold our sovereignty in the future. Thank you so much for all your time and sharing all your knowledge and like wisdom. We have learned so much and really wanna keep learning more and keep being better allies going forward. So thank you so much again. And um, if anyone that's attending wants to drop questions or we can close here. Thank you so much for being here, yeah. And for all the work you put in with us over this week. Um, leading up to this. I, I just want to acknowledge just how much work you both have put in, Brianka and, and Helen. Really a lot of respect to you and your efforts to, to teaching people about this and teaching yourselves. And I really agree with what Alexi said and what Jaleesa said, and I think it's so important to really acknowledge the history and, and the land you, you occupy. Um, so just thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much um, again for your time, and thank you to our amazing tech people, Anika and Anika, um, Anika, sorry. Um, so if you guys wanna pop in and say hi really quickly. Oh, Tiffany's here too. You can also say hi. Um, yeah, thank you all so much for your time. Thank you, Julissa, for joining us really last minute and sharing all your knowledge. And thank you, Alexi and Steven, for being here like with us every step of the way. And I think, is Lou still on? Well, Lou is watching, but thank you for all your time and knowledge as well, because that's been super helpful. Lots of gratitude for everything. <laughs>